happen because the load factor is not going to be up there. And um, so the fuel efficiency is not going to be as good. And usually they use the uh, regional transport, namely turboprops uh, class of airplane. And so if we take a look at the uh, operating economics, on the left-hand side table, you would see these aircraft such as Dash 8, Cessna 208, or the uh, Pilatus with a smaller number of passengers, namely um, 70 some passengers or 9 to 14 or 9 passengers. The passenger mile per gallon here will be quite a bit smaller uh, number than the, uh, the numbers you just saw for the 737 or Airbus 320. Namely, it could be 70 down to 30. And, um, but the fuel is not just the only story like Omar just talked about. There's other maintenance. And um, so if you ca calculate all the maintenance and crew and all the operating costs, on the right-hand side, you will see the bar graph. In this graph, everything is using the 737 MAX or 320 NEO as a baseline. And you will see that the uh, Dash 8 is actually 55% more in terms of the operating cost. And the caravan actually is three times worse, or 300 times, 300% uh, worse in terms of the operating cost. And um, even the electric car is worse in this case in terms of the operating cost. So um, this is a class in the hubs and spokes model that the electric aviation really ought to solve this problem. And this chart you will see the reason why so many airplanes would be failing, I mean airlines would be falling, uh, failing, particularly in, the, uh, in Europe here. Uh, from the 2017 to 2019, you can see, for example, here in Germany, we had uh, Germania back in February uh, file bankruptcy. And in 2018, there's quite a few uh, airlines, uh, including another one in Germany that's uh, Azure Air. And um, also, this is not just uh, in Germany, in uh, the European countries, but also in uh, Great Britain. So um, if you look at the US, you can find a similar uh, story in terms of the uh, operating economics. In fact, if you plot this against the fuel price fluctuation, and the red bars are those uh, airline companies that fail, it's almost one-on-one -on -one, uh, correlation there. Whenever you have the spikes of the fuel price, you will see a lot more of this company filing bankruptcy. So um, from these stories, uh, back in 2011, we had the competition of uh, who's the most efficient airplane in terms of the electrified uh, uh, airplane systems. So Pipistro actually um, had a demonstration of 403 passenger mile per gallon equivalent in this case, which really demonstrated to the world that we can operate so much better using the electric airplanes. And that opens up the doors to the electric aviation, particularly for the regional flights. Um, so Ampere's strategy here is to develop a total energy optimized short takeoff and landing aircraft, electric aircraft. And just from the very basic physics, you can figure out that the total range is the total energy density multiplied by the lift to drag ratio. This is a uh, arrow 101 here that everybody learns. And so having a wing really helps, right? Especially having a wing with very high aspect ratio for the lift to drag ratio. And so having the total energy density, this is not just the energy density of the batteries, but of the whole airplane. If you maximize that, you're actually helping it with the overall range of the airplane. And that is the unpair uh, strategy behind this total energy optimized airplane. But just a quick note on the short takeoff and landing airplanes, because um, a lot of people are talking the, about the eVTOL, but I think um, very few have ignored the ES toll, namely the short takeoff and landing aircraft capabilities. And so this is a shot from the um, Alaska competition of uh, short takeoff and landing. And these guys actually, you know, they would cut out part of the airplane just to save weight and they fly in their underwears so that they could save a lot of weight from the clothing, right? But the record is such that to take off, 
for this class of you know airplanes, you only need four meters, 4.2 meters, and for landing, only 3.2 meters. So it's almost as good as VTOL, and there's a lot of potentials there. Um, so in terms of the short takeoff and landing, it allows us to really transform the space of the market that is not just the hubs to spokes, the spokes part, but also it transformed this whole model to a dense web model in the right hand side, as you can see, if you were to go from A to B. And also it allows you to use a lot of airports that are currently under underutilized. So for example, comparing the, uh, you can see the uh, two columns here, from the European Union and also from the USA, there are lots of civil aircraft in general aviation, and there's also a lot of airliners, thousands of airliners. But the airports that are open to the public with paved runways and also with regular scheduled flights are only about 2,250 for European uh, countries. And for USA, there's about 5,300 uh, airports. And when you talk about airports with regular flights, it comes down to even smaller numbers. So 438 for European <laughs> countries and 400 to 500 airports for the US. So if you calculate that, it's about a quarter of the overall usable airports that are open to the public for European countries and about uh, one tenth of the total usable public airports for the US. So there's enormous potential in order to have the new routes and use these airports, existing airports. And a lot of them are about these, uh, what's called the mega cities. And so you don't really have to go to EV tall, you could do ES tall in these uh, situations, utilizing the existing airports. But in the existing airports, there are a lot of them that are closing in the US. And I'm sure you've heard the story, for example, of Santa Monica. They were given like 10 years, this, this was three years ago, they were given 20, 10 years to close down. Why? Because of Santa Monica airport pollution, airplane pollution, and noise. Um, so, let's take a look at the noise uh, footprint here. This is just uh, average uh, noise published from some of these uh, vehicles. So, for example, SR22, about uh, 86 dB, and then uh, 737 MAX actually has reduced the noise quite a bit, uh, down to between 70 and 75. And uh, from the 2011 competition, the E-Genius actually won the competition with uh, a little bit more than 50 dB. So once again, the potential of the electric airplanes in reducing the noise uh, is tremendous and has been shown here. So what comes with the um, noise reduction is that in terms of the regulations, the noise requirements for the airplanes have become more and more stringent. And so we talk about Developing a new airplane, well, we talked about the market and technologies, and the third part of this requirement is from the certification. Well, noise is part of that, but there's also other parts, right? So let's look at this uh, approach that Ampere is taking in terms of getting a fast track to the market, combining the three, uh, um, three areas. So Ampere's approach in this scaling is going from a Cessna 337 six-seat airplane to a nine-seater, 19-seater, and then eventually bigger and the brand new airplane of the tailwind. And in so doing, um, of course, scaling up to have the lessons learned from implementing on some of the existing platform is uh, one big enabler. But also, this allows us to do the product upgrade with a new energy density uh, improvement from the battery packs uh, evolution. So this is a uh, very well enabled approach in terms of scaling. And also in terms of the value chain, um, Ampere does not make any components ourselves. But um, we work with the suppliers, just like uh, Eviation just now um, have said. We work with the suppliers from around the world and we leverage on some of the strengths that the uh, OEMs and MROs have in terms of the existing platforms. 
So we partner with them in terms of uh, electrifying these existing platforms. And that also enables us at the same time to uh, obtain some revenue, revenues along the way. So that's the value chain. And here's a uh, small video of the uh, first Cessna 337 that we use as a demonstrator and eventually also work on the uh, STC with the uh, manufacturer. So as you can see, we've uh, taken out one of the existing uh, engine on the back in the propulsion plant and built with it the uh, electric propulsion power, power train, as well as a swappable battery pack down um, below the uh, fuse wash. So we have a very capable team working on this, about 18 people. And uh, what you're looking at, the airplane behind it is actually our iron bird. It's not the actual bird that we're test flying. And as you can see, our um, background here on the bottom, listed on the bottom, are mainly half from the aerospace industry and the other half with the um, automotive industry, particularly electric vehicles uh, background. And um, we're not just working with uh, ourselves, those 18 people, we actually have global partnership from all those countries. In particular, we have um, the Chinese partners uh, who have provided us a very nice hangar, as well as office space and dormitory. And we are teaming with the, uh, the rest of the industry in developing the standards. Um, as uh, you've seen in this uh, conference here, we have uh, quite a few of these uh, standard committee meetings, such as ASTM. But back home, we're also working with the CalCharge, some of the infrastructure groups, and also the airport groups. Uh, as we all know that the electric airplanes need to be charged, and so the infrastructure part and the interface is very, very important for us. Um, and then later on this year, in, uh, in the summer, late summer, we're going to do a flight demo together with the Mokalele Air Airlines in Hawaii. And that is funded by the uh, Elemental uh, Accelerator. And so um, in, the, in the web, you can find some of the videos of our um, uh, working together with the uh, Mokalele Airlines. And that's to be coming this summer. And eventually, we would like to help uh, with all the um, uh, different partners and customers in different parts of the world with some very challenging terrains and uh, geography and those areas where you cannot reach easily by any other boats of transportation. And so this is a great example of uh, the uh, northern part of Europe. And I'd like to uh, just leave you with this uh, takeaway chart. And this is from a, a committee report um, from 1941. And as some of you might know, this was the dawn of the jet aviation. That was the second revolution. And this report was provided by um, the people that's uh, written here, Von Karman, Milliken, Kettering, and the rest of the three people. Just a little background on these people. Von Karman, of course, he's the father of um, uh, aerodynamics, basically, the modern-day aerodynamics about 60 years ago. And Milliken, he was a Nobel Prize winner. And Kettering, he, um, he had a great contribution in GM, and um, in fact, he, was, uh, he holds more than 100 patents in terms of automobile, uh, uh, automobile propulsion, including the, uh, uh, the air conditioning system and using the uh, uh, electric starters as well. And the three of those, uh, last three of those people were from Harvard University. So in this quote, I'll quickly read it, that they believe the gas turbine could hardly be considered a feasible application to airplanes, mainly because of uh, complying with the stringent weight requirements imposed by aeronautics. And the present, or back then, the internal combustion engine used in airplanes weighs about 1.1 pounds per horsepower. To approach such a figure with gas turbines seems beyond the realm of possibility with existing materials. So that was the dawn of the second revolution for the jet engines. And I'm sure today there's a lot of skeptics about the battery energy densities and so on. But it will happen, and maybe very soon, one day you'll hear 
people laughing at those who are having the skeptical uh, comments about the batteries and about electric aviation. So with that, I'll open up for questions from the audience. Thank you. Yes, question up front. What about continental investment? What about investment from continental motor? Oh, um, well, actually, uh, Continental Motor, well, I cannot talk about that because we have uh, NDAs uh, with each other. So, thank you for the question. It's public. Uh, it is public for, I don't know what you're referring to, but uh, Ampere is collaborating with Continental. I'm referring to a press release. Ah, okay. It's all right. Any other questions? I'm very clear, I guess. So that gives a little bit of time for the next program, the Limburg Innovation Forum. And um, so Arvind, uh, well, thank you for your attention. If there's no more questions, and uh, we're ready for the next one, Arvind. I'm giving you like five minutes. <laughs>